So how did we get to this point of questioning? The answer is what has been called the quest for the historical Jesus. Here we're going to briefly survey four phases of this quest. In the 18th and 19th century, what has been called the first quest for the historical Jesus sought to find a Jesus set free from the mythical worldview of the Bible. Drawing from philosophical rationalism that arose during the birth of science and the period of the Enlightenment, scholars tried to find a non-supernatural Jesus. Many of these scholars concluded that Jesus was a mere man, an ethical teacher, proclaiming the love of God and the brotherhood of all human beings. The miracles, they said, could be explained away from unrecognized causes or perhaps mistaken observations made by primitive peoples. The feeding of the 5,000, one scholar suggested, occurred when rich people were encouraged to share their own lunches by a little boy's unselfish example. Another scholar suggested that Jesus only appeared to be walking on the water, when in fact he was walking near the shore and there was a mist covering his feet. These are rationalistic attempts to explain the miracles of Jesus. Albert Schweitzer, in his classic book, The Quest for the Historical Jesus, chronicled this first quest. He showed that these scholars were merely creating a Jesus in their own image. They transformed the historical Jesus into a modern philanthropist, preaching an inoffensive message of love and brotherhood. With Schweitzer's devastating critique, the first quest petered out. A second phase that followed this first quest has been identified as a period of no quest or extreme skepticism concerning the historical Jesus. It's identified especially with Rudolf Bultmann, the leading German New Testament scholar of the 20th century. Many people and things influenced Bultmann's perspective. Let me just point to a few of these key influences. The first influence was David Friedrich Strauss, who in his book, The Life of Christ Critically Examined, denied that we could find natural explanations for supernatural events in the Gospels. He argued instead that the miracle tradition as a whole represented myths and legends that developed over a long period of time. While before Strauss, the Gospel of Mark was considered to be a generally reliable historical account, Strauss claimed that it was mostly myth and legend created by the later church. If Strauss claimed the Gospels were overlaid with myths, William Rada sought to show that the Gospels were theologically motivated propaganda rather than historical narrative. He challenged the first quest assumption concerning the historicity of Mark's Gospel, claiming that Mark and others before him had created a motif he called the messianic secret as a way to explain Jesus' essentially unmessianic life. The significance of Rada's work was that the Gospels were now increasingly viewed not as historical documents, but as apologetically motivated propaganda intended to promote the theology of the early church. If Strauss and Rada questioned the historicity of the Gospels, Johannes Weiss challenged the 19th century view of Jesus as an enlightened liberal social reformer. He sought to place Jesus' kingdom preaching in its first century context. In this context, Weiss said, the kingdom of God was understood as God's end time intervention to dramatically judge the wicked and deliver the righteous. According to Weiss, Jesus was a wild-eyed apocalyptic prophet expecting the soon end of the world. In his book, The So-Called Historical Jesus and the Historic Biblical Christ, published in 1892, Martin Kaler claimed that the quest of the historical Jesus was completely misguided and was doomed to failure. Kaler claimed that the so-called historical Jesus, reconstructed by the rationalists, was not the real just Jesus at all, but a figment of scholarly imagination. The only real Jesus was the Christ of faith worshipped in the church. While Kaler's goal was to salvage the significance of Jesus for the church, in fact, he separated the historical Jesus from the church's Christ. We come now to Rudolf Bultmann's perspective, which was influenced by all of these people and others. Like Strauss, Bultmann claimed that the Gospels were filled with myths that arose in the context of the preaching of the early church. The earliest church had little interest in the historical Jesus. They were concerned only with the Christ of faith who they worshipped in the present, rather than the Jesus of history shrouded in the mysteries of the past. Since the Christ of faith was still speaking to the church through the prophets, Bultmann said that the church had no problem placing the words of these prophets and teachers on the lips of Jesus. 
He assumed that the eyewitnesses played almost no role in passing down the traditions about Jesus. It followed from this that the origin of the gospel tradition must be found in the theological concerns of the early church rather than in the life of the historical Jesus. From his perspective, the historical quest for Jesus was DOA, was dead on arrival. This period of no quest and Rudolf Bultmann gave way to a new or second quest. Some of Bultmann's students felt his skepticism had gone too far. And in the 1950s, they launched what has been called the new or second quest for the historical Jesus. It was sparked especially by a lecture given by Ernst Kaseman, one of Bultmann's students. Kaseman's claim was that since Jesus was in fact a historical figure, we should be able to discern something about his identity and his goals by looking at the historical evidence. While rejecting Bultmann's extreme skepticism, these scholars started with the same basic negative assumptions. These assumptions included rejection of the supernatural as impossible, the assumption that the Gospels are theological rather than historical documents, motivated theologically rather than to record accurate historical events. And third, the assumption that the Gospel writers were not eyewitnesses at all, but were far removed from Jesus in space and time. The result of the second quest was a minimalist perspective that did not go much beyond Bultmann's no-quest conclusions. While the second quest did not get very far, from the 1980s onward, a great deal of new research on Jesus has emerged. Some are calling this work a third quest for the historical Jesus. This quest has been sparked by advances in linguistics, archaeology, and the deployment of new methodologies, such as socio-cultural methodologies, anthropological, rhetorical methodologies. New methods continue to appear. For example, one recent area of research has centered on social memory theory. How do communities remember and pass down authoritative tradition? And what can this tell us about the gospel tradition? Another methodology is called performance criticism, which examines the gospels not so much as literary works, but as written records of oral performances in the early church. Because there is such enormous diversity among Jesus scholars today, it's probably inappropriate to speak of a single third quest. Instead, we should speak merely of an incredibly rich, diverse, and multifaceted historical Jesus research.